The text for this morning's sermon is from Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 20. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lay, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with an a the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. If you haven't already, please open your Bible to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 20. This is part two of a three-part series here for the Advent season. Pastor Jason Harrison began it last Sunday as we looked at Genesis 3 and the fall of mankind, but also the first gospel. Genesis 3.15, the promised serpent crusher. And today is the arrival and announcement. So we look at Luke 2, and then next Sunday we have the pleasure of hearing from Connor Kennedy as he finishes the series. But today we're looking at Luke 2, arrival and announcement. And so I just want to pray briefly, ask for God's blessing, and we're going to jump in. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. And Lord, I, I pray that the familiarity of this passage would not be too familiar. We would not fail to marvel at what we see here. Lord, this is not a Christmas passage only. This passage could and should be preached in July as we marvel over the coming of the long-awaited Redeemer. Lord, I pray for any of your people who Though free from Satan's tyranny, though free from the dominion of sin, by being justified by faith alone in Christ alone, yet are still afflicted, Lord, would you save them all from Satan's power? And we long for the day when the wounded snake is cast into the lake of fire. And with that, we say, come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Growing up in North Florida, I learned at a young age about the perils of living in close proximity to snakes, a lot of snakes. It's amazing that anyone who grew up in the South, specifically the Deep South where I grew up, didn't develop some form of PTSD. Because just to go outside and play, my dad had a couple of acres, we had horses, we had a barn, and so what appeared to be a pristine North Florida day full of the promise of adventure, you had to be mindful because behind the shed or under the wood pile or by the garage or anywhere could be lurking any number of poisonous snakes. And you had to check your shoes for fire ants and 
all the above. So a lot of reasons to move to Florida, a lot of reasons not to. But one thing you had to know, so we were catechized in the Redneck Catechism. <laughs> and I know my, my grandma's probably watching this right now in Florida. The Redneck Catechism, question one. How can you tell the difference between a coral snake and a king snake, one of which is poisonous, one of which is not, but they look very similar? Answer, red on black, okay, Jack, red on yellow, kill a fellow. My dad had a coral snake crawl across his boot on the front porch one night, and you just sit really still. Why do I bring this up now that everyone who has a phobia of snakes will hear nothing else that I say? The threat of snakes for us growing up in North Florida was a constant and perennial threat. And as I was writing this, I had a flourish of poetic insight. And I said, the threat of snakes was for us a constant reality that flavored all of our fun like a bitter and unwelcome spice. I'm, I'm still bitter about growing up in this environment. But just as there is a crimson thread running throughout the entirety of the Old Testament. We've, we've talked about how there's a crimson thread. Jason talked about it last Sunday, Genesis 3.15, mankind has fallen, and yet they leave the garden, though banished from the presence of God, clothed in animal skins, with a promise resounding in their ears that I will send a seed of the woman to crush the head of the serpent. And for the totality of the Old Testament, that promise is ratified and repeated and recapitulated, and all through the sin of Israel and all the ups and downs, there is the promise of the coming Redeemer. It's not Moses, it's not David, but he is coming. But as there is a crimson thread running throughout the Old Testament, there's also something else that lurks in the corners of human history after Genesis 3. As the story of redemption unfolds, we find evidence of the presence of the serpent. Just as you can find old snake skins. If you grew up in North Florida, you don't walk out and see snakes everywhere, but you see evidence of them. You can see their tracks in the sand. Certain times of year, you find snake skins in the yard. Just subtle reminders that they are unseen, but they are present. And just as you can find old snake skins in your yard, you can find evidence in the Old Testament of the presence of the serpent. What do you mean, Aaron? Quick review. Job 1.6, Satan afflicts Job. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. Satan tempts David in 2 Chronicles 21. Then Satan stood against Israel and incited David to number Israel. Satan accused Joshua in Zechariah 3.1. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. Interesting, somewhat cryptic passage in Jude 9 tells us that Satan argued with the angel Michael over the body of Moses. Jude 9 tells us, but when the archangel Michael contending with the devil was disputing about the body of Moses. Idol worship throughout the entire Old Testament was directly linked to satanic and demonic activity. In Deuteronomy 32, 16, it says, they stirred him to jealousy with strange gods. With abominations, they provoked him to anger. They sacrificed to demons that were no gods, to gods they have never known, to new gods that had come recently, whom your fathers had never dreaded. My family and I were watching the Nativity movie. It came out a few years ago. And as I was watching the scene, and, and they try to make it family friendly, but it's hard to, to clean up infanticide. And they were showing the scene where Herod gives the edict to slaughter all the male children to and under. And as a father of four boys, I thought, this has to be demonically influenced. Although Herod is culpable for what he did, you can hear the hiss of the serpent from the garden throughout human history. You think, wow, great Christmas message. Last Sunday, Jason Harrison said this, quote, It is to our peril if we ignore the truth about Satan's temptations. Satan tempts people today. We are not just wrestling against flesh and sin, 
Peter says, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour, 1 Peter 5.8. As we come to Luke chapter 2, we see a lot more than a cute Christmas story. A lot more. The arrival and the announcement of Christ was surrounded, surrounded with supernatural occurrences. I mean, just go back to Luke 1 and read into it. There are myriad supernatural occurrences happening here. And that's good news because we face a supernatural enemy. This is what was burdening my heart. Christians in the West often adopt a naturalistic worldview rather than a supernatural worldview. And if we do that, we run the risk of dulling the edge of the Christmas story, a highly supernatural occurrence. And on a personal level, as one who bears innumerable fang marks and scars on his body, his soul, and his mind, I delight to see the arch enemy the accuser of the brethren, the tempter and hater of my kinsmen, I delight to see him coil up in fear. What's the main point of Luke 2? With all of this background, two threads running out of the garden, promise of grace, presence of the serpent, We just sang this morning about Satan being vanquished. Part of the good news of the good news of the coming of the Redeemer is that that serpent is going to be crushed. So here's how I got the main point boiled down. God's orchestration of Christ's incarnation confirms Satan's devastation. God's orchestration of Christ's incarnation confirms Satan's devastation. And for anyone afflicted by the old serpent, that is really good news. We see three acts of God in this text. Prophecy fulfilled, peace declared, promise confirmed. Prophecy fulfilled, peace declared, promise confirmed. Act number one, prophecy fulfilled. Let's look at verses one through seven. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his town. So let's just hold up here. In verse 1, we see the mention of Caesar Augustus. This is a title, and this is referring to Julius Caesar's grandnephew, whose name was Caius Octavius. Two things are noteworthy here. Augustus, Caesar Augustus, is a title. If something is august, it means that it is majestic and glorious. It was a title of religious veneration. You see why the early Christians had such a hard time paying homage and giving incense to Caesar. Because embedded in the title is one who is worthy of worship. Caesar Augustus, the majestic one, the exalted one, is what that title means. And during his reign, Caesar Augustus, who is actually Caius Octavius, during his long reign was what is known as the Pax Romana, the Peace of Rome. It was a period of Roman domination and prosperity. So in verse 1, in the days a decree went out from this one who dares to claim the title of the august one, the majestic one, worthy, and the one who his reign is able to bring in peace, albeit by the edge of the sword. What does this one call for? All the world should be registered. All the known Roman world at that time should be registered. In verse 1, this registration refers to a census of the inhabited Roman world, and it began a cycle that would be repeated every 14 years. This universal census would be used 
not so much to enroll military service, but to levy poll taxes. It was a symbol to the Jews of Roman oppression. What's interesting is that this one who is in his hubris and in his arrogance taking upon himself the title of the majestic and venerated one who brings in the peace of Rome, he's making decisions from a human element to call a census. Do you think he woke up that morning and had a text from God saying, hey, I need need to fulfill prophecy. Could you please call a census? No, not at all. This is a pagan to the core who worships demonic forces. I mean, let's not sanitize early Rome, right? He woke up and said, I'm going to call a census, and yet what do we see God doing? It's what he always does, working in and through concurrently the sinful acts of wicked men to bring about his will. That right there is worth its own sermon, and that right there is very good news to us today. God works in and through the sinful, prideful edicts of pagan leaders to fulfill his purposes. But look at verse 6. So we know the story. I'm assuming a lot here. We know that through this registration, verse 4 says, Joseph also went up from Galilee to the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. So that's where he had to go. Wicked man calls the census, ends up bringing Joseph to the place known as Bethlehem because he was of the house and lineage of David, King David to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. So evil edict brings the soon-to-be-born Messiah to this place. Why is this important? Because of Micah 5.2. What does Micah 5.2, what did it prophesy? One of, not the only, but one of the ways we prove the veracity of Scripture is the fulfillment of prophecy. Here's a biggie. Micah 5.2 says, but you, O Bethlehem, you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is able to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from old, from ancient days. That's what we see being fulfilled in verse 6. While they were there, the time came for her to give birth. Of course it did. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there's no place for them in the inn. Beloved, just looking at this first section contextually, historically, getting away from over-familiarity, which can blunt the edge of the supernatural aspects of the coming of the Redeemer, the baby born in Bethlehem, he was the prince of peace, It was not Caesar, and it was not the Pax Romana. It was him, the Prince of Peace. He was the truly august one, the exalted one, the majestic one. It was not Caesar. And as is usual, God used the hubris and the greed of sinful rulers, many of them influenced by the demons they worshipped, to bring about his sovereign will and purpose. The rescuer of sinful and enslaved men and women arrived quietly and unadorned in the midst of enemy territory, right in the serpent's den. And when that happened, think about all the totality of the Old Testament and all the satanic activity that's taking place ever since the garden, afflicting poor Job whispering in David's ear, sending out his minions of demonic hordes. What was behind all the idolatrous worship of the Old Testament? It's clear. It's demons. It's him. It's the serpent. But here, with the first cry of that baby, we see the snake coil up in fear. And as one who's been bitten by him more times than I can count, I love that. The first act we see of God here is prophecy fulfilled. The second is peace declared. Peace declared. Look at verse 8. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. I remember the year. 
1986. I had very high hopes of being cast as Joseph that year. But I knew my hopes were dashed when my mother began to bring out a blue bathrobe and a white towel and a stick. And I knew that my fate had been sealed. I had been cast as a shepherd. Anyone else get cast as a shepherd back in the day? <laughs> Let me just encourage you as we look at this portion of the text. It's a good gig to be a shepherd. And whether you think it's a good gig or not, that's who we are here. What do I mean? Verse 8, the shepherds are in their field keeping watch over the flock by night. This is significant because shepherds were considered ceremonially unclean due to their occupation. Of all the people in Israel, to have the drumbeat of the Old Testament that is saying, he's coming, he's coming, he's coming, he's coming, he's here. And for all the people to receive that, it is those that are considered ceremonially unclean. That's us. And what do they hear? <laughs> Look at verse 9. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, the unclean ones, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. That's not surprising. When sinners are exposed to the light of God's holiness and glory, fear is the appropriate response. And this is what makes the angels' announcement such good news. What do they say to them? Don't forget, angels have showed up in the Old Testament to slaughter and to burn cities, okay? And here are sinful, unclean men. What's going to be said to them? Look at 10. And the angel said to them, fear not. Everyone breathe a sigh of relief. Angels are not cute. They are mega intimidating. And the angel says, fear not. Why? For behold, I bring you, look at those two words right there. What, what do you bring an angel? Good news. What's another word for good news? Gospel. I bring you unclean outcast gospel. Ah of great joy that will be for all people. Look at verse 11. For unto you, unto you who are enslaved to the tyranny of the serpent, you whose veins flow with the venom of your father the devil, to you, not to the leaders, not to the upper echelon, but to the unclean, to the ones who know they're sick, to you is coming what? In the city of David, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. That's good news. The shepherds like us were indeed unclean. Everything that Paul says in Ephesians 2 was true of the shepherds, and it's true of us. In Ephesians 2, Paul says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live. So your sins that you committed, and when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. Who did we follow? The serpent. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, Paul says, we, like the shepherds, were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And that's exactly what they declare. Verse 11, what do these unclean, serpent-following shepherds hear? Unto you is born the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. He is the Savior and He is Lord. That's a pregnant title. Supreme, absolute authority in that one. We need 
someone like that to, quote, save us all from Satan's power when we were gone astray. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy. And what does this produce? Look at the doxology of verse 14. There was with this angel a multitude, and what do they say? Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those who clean themselves up by their own moral fortitude and deserve God's favor. Is that what your says? That would not be good news. Look what the angels say. Glory to God in the highest and on earth. Peace among those with whom he is pleased. With whom he is pleased. God is holy. We, like the shepherds, are unclean and unholy. How can that God be pleased with us? One word. What is it? Grace. Grace. The Romans thought that the Pax Romana gave them peace. Pagan religions taught that paying homage to nature or straight to demons would bring peace. Sinners today think that they have peace with God because they are good people. And the old serpent loves that kind of deception. There is only one way to true peace, and it is found in John 14, 6. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And with the announcement to the unclean shepherds, that serpent that's been slithering through the pages of our Old Testament, who's been afflicting the people of God, who's been deceiving the nations. I mean, Molech. Think of all the filth flowing through the Old Testament. Now, with this announcement, he begins to coil around himself and rattle his tail. Did the demons not come when Christ was walking the earth? And what did they say? We know who you are, son of God. Are you here to destroy us before the time? I love to see the enemy of my soul and the hater of my kinsmen fearful. In this text, we see prophecy fulfilled, peace declared, and promise confirmed. Look at verse 15. When the angels went away from them, the shepherds, into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. When it says, which the Lord has made known to us, it's implying promise. And look at what it says here in verse 16. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And as I was just meditating on that, they went with haste. I mean, their adrenaline's pumping, kind of just had a big moment, an existential moment, right? But, but maybe these unclean shepherds weren't so ignorant after all. Perhaps they knew the scriptures well enough to know that what is happening right here in their lifetime, maybe it clicked in their brain, this this is it. This is everything that our ancestors prayed for and dreamed of and hoped for. This is the Genesis 3.15 day. It's, we got to go. I think maybe they knew something that this promise that was made so many centuries ago is happening. That's a th- that may be a thing called ontological shock. I remember the, the day of 9-11. Things that make you say, this can't be. Could it be that they're running with haste because this is a form of ontological shock that all the promises that maybe they memorized as young Jewish men just exploded in their brain and they said, this is it. So what do they do? Verse 17. When they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard wondered, marveled, were amazed at what the shepherds told them. (laughs) 
What do these shepherds do? It says the shepherds in verse 20, they returned glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. Beloved, this should be the reaction of everyone who knows that life under the tyranny of the serpent is miserable. Everyone whose legs are weary from dancing to the tune of Satan's flute should rejoice to know that the serpent crusher has arrived. Do you see what happens to these shepherds? Unclean, outcast, boom. I come to you, don't be afraid, because I come bringing grace. I bring the gospel of grace to you. God's sovereign initiative has come to you to let you know that that promise that was made so long ago, that generations stood on tiptoes to see coming, it's happening tonight, boys. And he's well pleased to tell you, what do graced sinners do when they realize the weight of the gospel? It says they went and told people. The shepherds became probably the first evangelist in some prototypical sense. That's what happens when sinners taste forgiveness. When sinners who they know that they are poisoned by the serpent and yet in Christ find healing. It says they went with haste and they told everybody. Viewing the storyline of Scripture from the garden to Luke 2, I was just thinking of the thread, a thread of grace. God's bringing about his promise, but there's also this snakeskins along the way. As I was thinking about this, I had a song playing on repeat in my mind that I eventually put on my playlist. It's by the great and revered theologian, Johnny Cash. God's going to cut you down. You can run on for a long time. Run on for a long time. But sooner or later, God will cut you down. Tell the rambler, the gambler, the backbiter, tell that long-tongued liar, go and tell the midnight rider, tell him that God's going to cut him down. Beloved, I have no doubt that many of you have faced acute spiritual warfare at some point in your walk with the Lord. Some of it you never talk about lest you be labeled a fanatic. From the whispering voices at night that remind you of past sin to the unsettling presence of evil that makes the hair on your arm stand up. The old serpent still loves to torment God's children. Remember when I said a purely naturalistic worldview blunts the edge of the reality of a supernatural worldview? Wayne Grudem says this, quote, The tactics of Satan and his demons are to use lies, deception, murder, and every other kind of destructive activity to attempt to cause people to turn away from God and destroy themselves. Demons will try every tactic to blind people to the gospel and keep them in bondage to things that hinder them from coming to God. They will also try to use temptation and doubt and guilt and fear and confusion and sickness and envy and pride and slander or any other means possible to hinder a Christian's witness and usefulness, end quote. Beloved, I long for the day when I and my brothers and sisters in Christ are free from the gnawing anxiety of knowing that we have an enemy prowling around in the shadows. And this is why I'm so eager to hear from Brother Connor next Sunday as we look to the cross of Christ. I want that foot to drop right on that head. But that's his sermon, not mine. I'll leave it to you, brother. You know, you know that we can take heart. For now, we know how the story ends, don't we? We know that the words of Paul were meant for us. Listen to how Paul encourages Christians. 
This is Romans 8. This is not Old Testament. This is not the day of Pentecost. This is normal Christian living. And how does he exhort them? Paul says this in Romans 8, 38 and 39. He says, for I am sure that neither death nor life nor what? Angels or rulers. What's that? Demons. Nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That serpent that still crawls around has been conquered, cannot separate God's people. Though he may afflict because of what we sing about at Christmas, the coming of this babe, it is so much more than a glow mold nativity set in somebody's yard. If you have one, God bless you. That's fine. But if, if that's where we go, like, oh, it's Christmas time, that's what we do, think about the cosmic, universal, theological implications of what it means to say joy to the world. The Savior is here. From what? Sin and Satan's tyranny, something that the Reformers wrote about a lot. If you are not united to Jesus Christ by faith, hear me. This serpent is your master. In John 8, 44, Jesus says to the religious leaders, you are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character for he's a liar and the father of lies. Friend, if you are not in Christ by faith, that you have repented from your sin. Come to him with empty hands and said, Lord Jesus, Lord, supreme authority, forgive me, save me. I cast myself upon you with no recourse to my works, to my merit, nothing in my hands I bring. If that is not your testimony, the great serpent will not only strike your heel, but he will take your soul. And he will take it to everlasting torment with himself. He hates you. He will not give any quarter. You will find no mercy with this taskmaster. So I urge you, come to Christ now. Come find safety in him now. There is only one name that the demons fear. It is not Paul. And it is not yours. It is Jesus. Come to him. And you will find him to be a wonderful master. It is easy to obey and follow one who gave his life for you. Humanity's only hope at Christmas and every other day of the year is the promised snake crusher, Jesus Christ. Only by faith in him can we sing these words. No more let sins and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow as far as the curse is found. Joy to the world. I think a good candidate for another Christmas song is not Johnny Cash, but it's this. And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God has willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fail him. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we come to you. We thank you that those of us who once gladly followed after the old serpent, the prince of the power of the air, you came and burst into our lives like you did those shepherds. You came to seek and save the lost. We were not looking for you. There's only one seeker. 
But we thank you for this gospel of good news with those whom you are pleased, this gospel of grace that by faith in Christ we are taken out of the realm of Adam, taken out from underneath the bondage to Satan. The prince of the power of the air is no match for the prince of peace and the Lord of the universe. And by our affiliation with this one, we are declared righteous. If this wounded snake comes and whispers in the ears of my kinsmen, my brothers and sisters, reminding them of old sins, reminding them of their failure, tempting them to doubt, tempting them to self-destruction, Lord, I pray, I pray that the the songs that we have sung and the promises of your word and the glory of Christ would eclipse and overshadow and drown out any of the hissings of this angry but fearful snake. And Lord, we long for the day, we long for the day when this fearful snake, coiled and ready to strike, is thrown into the lake of fire. Lo, his doom is sure. May we all be partakers in the victory of Christ, the snake crusher, in his name, amen.